In this video, we're going to talk about ketamine, another IV anesthetic. So just like the other IV anesthetics, we're going to talk about the mechanism of action of ketamine. And we're going to keep things simple. Ketamine works on multiple different receptors because it is a pretty unique anesthetic, and it's almost like a jack of all trades. But like I said, we're gonna keep things simple and talk about the uh, most, most uh, talked about mechanism of action of ketamine. It works at the NMDA receptors. And a little bit about this receptor, which we touched on in a prior video, is the NMDA receptor is an excitatory, allows for excitatory signal transduction via the protein glutamate or amino acid glutamate. So glutamate ends up binding to the NMDA receptors and that opens the NMDA channels allowing positive cations to go into the cell increasing Increasing the action potential, causing depolarization and eventual uh, awareness or consciousness. What ketamine does, and I'll draw it in red here, ketamine is an antagonist of the NMDA receptor. So NMDAR. antagonist. So it prevents the entrance of these uh, positive cations into the NMDA receptor into the cell causing depolarization and consciousness. So that's that's how it works. Ketamine also works on the uh, mu opioid receptors, the kappa opioid receptors, the delta recept opioid receptors, um, Ketamine also works at this receptor called HCN1. So ketamine works in multiple areas, but the main focus is an NMDA receptor antagonist. And now we're going to talk about the structure of ketamine. So ketamine is a phencyclidine analog. Analog. So fencyclidine is used in veterinary, or was used in veterinary practice. I don't know if it's still used now. But uh, it is, ketamine is a less potent form of the fencyclidine. And ketamine is pretty unique. Ketamine causes amnesia. Like I said, it's almost a jack of all trades. Whereas propofol and atomidate, the drugs that we talked about earlier, cause uh, anesthesia, ketamine causes anesthesia and analgesia. So it causes amnesia, unconsciousness, and it also causes analgesia, which is something that we haven't seen yet. The propofol and atomidate do not cause analgesia. Benzodiazepines do not cause analgesia. Barbiturates do not cause analgesia. But ketamine causes analgesia. The opioids cause analgesia, but they don't cause amnesia or unconsciousness. So they're not anesthetics. They're more for pain control, similar to that triangle that we talked about earlier uh, in the first video. So ketamine causes this dissociation between sensation and awareness. So you'll see this dissociative state uh, in patients who receive or who get ketamine. Our ketamine dose in the IV form is 1 to 2 milligrams per kilogram. And its effects wear off. Its onset, I should mention, onset is 1 minute. And then its duration is about 10 minutes, minutes.
And its effects wear off in 10 minutes primarily by, you guessed it, redistribution from the central nervous system to its peripheral compartments. And that's how emergence occurs after an initial dosage. The other unique thing about ketamine is not only can it be given in an IV form, it can be given in an IM form, it can be given in an oral form, it can be given in a sub-Q form, it can be given in an epidural uh, in an epidural catheter into the epidural space. So like I said, it, it, ketamine kind of does it all. It's in multiple forms, and it allows for your full scope of that anesthesia, that anesthesia triangle of amnesia, analgesia, and akinesia. I can't see that, but akinesia. Going back to the IM form of ketamine, the dosage is 3 to 5 milligrams per kilogram. And then we'll, we won't talk about the oral or the sub-Q form, just to continue going with our discussion. So we talked about the mechanism, we talked about the dosage. Now we're going to talk about the metabolism of ketamine. So ketamine is metabolized by the liver. I'll draw my K there. And it's primarily metabolized by cytochrome P450, namely the CYP3A4 class of the cytochromes. And that is going to cause some of the ketamine to be in the inactive form, but also some of the ketamine to be in another active form form called norketamine. The norketamine is less potent than the ketamine, uh, than, than the unmetabolized ketamine or the ketamine over here, but it's still in active form. So it could still have some effects uh, in, the, in the body in the central nervous system. Ketamine is excreted by the kidneys. excreted by the kidneys. And now we'll talk about some of the properties, uh, effects on the heart, on the lungs, and on the brain of ketamine. And I'll draw the brain. So one thing to know about ketamine, it is a direct cardiovascular depressant. However, when you give ketamine, you will see a rise in your blood pressure. You'll see a rise in your heart rate, in your cardiac output. And this may be very counterintuitive and not make sense. How can a direct cardiovascular depressant cause an increase in your cardiac output? Well, it's because ketamine's indirect cardiovascular effects are stronger than its direct cardiovascular depressant effects. And the indirect cardiovascular effects of ketamine is due to a decrease in your norepinephrine reuptake. So I'm going to circle that because this is what's going to win out. There's going to be an increase in your catecholamines as a result of administration of ketamine. And even though ketamine will depress your cardio cardiovascular system, the, uh, the indirect effects of having more circulating norepinephrine and catecholamines out is going to win over that cardiovascular depressant effect. So that's why ketamine is used when you want to, uh, in trauma situations, when you want to preserve heart rate and blood pressure, because you're going to see this increase in heart rate and increase in, increase in heart rate and increase in blood pressure when you administer ketamine. That being said, 
you have to be careful in patients who are depleted of their natural norepinephrine and catecholamine, um, catecholamine concentrations, you will see that cardiovascular depressant uh, effect win out. So you must be careful when you use it for patients who have cardiovascular disease because you do not want to cause ischemia because of that increased sympathetic effect. In the lungs, ketamine has a minimal effect on your ventilation. Ketamine does cause an increase in salivation, but you can mitigate that by administering an anticholinergic, such as glycopyrrolate. So give, I'll put glyco. And one of the other interesting things about ketamine is it is a bronchodilator. So it can be used in patients who have uh, severe asthma and act as a bronchodilator. And then ketamine's effect on the brain. Ketamine causes an increase in your cerebral blood flow and an increase in your cerebral metabolic rate of consumption in the brain. So it is, a, it is almost like a stimulating effect or excitatory effect that ketamine has on the, on the metabolism of the brain. It increases the oxygen consumption in the brain. And then we'll finish off with special characteristics. And we'll just talk about one. If you give ketamine, you do have a risk of emergence delirium. So patients, because of that dissociation, they can uh, wake up delirious. If you give benzodiazepines prior to giving the ketamine on induction, you reduce that risk. So we'll go back up. Ketamine is an NMDA and HCN receptor antag NMDA receptor antagonist and HCN receptor antagonist. It uh, is a fencyclidine analog. It has an effect on all parts of this triangle here, amnesia, unconsciousness, analgesia. It's a jack of all trades of an, an anesthetic medication. Dose, it can be given IV, IM, multiple different ways. You can give it intranasally as well. IV dose is one to two milligrams per kilogram, takes about a minute, and, and uh, has a duration of action of about 10 minutes. Its effects get eliminated via redistribution, metabolized by CYP3A4, and it has an inactive and active form. The active form is less potent than its original form. Both get excreted by the kidneys. Its effects on the heart, even though it's a direct cardiovascular depressant, its sympathetic effects, indirect sympathetic effects will win out, causing an increase in your heart rate and blood pressure, has minimal effects on ventilation, it does increase your salivation, so you give an anticholinergic, and it is good for using in patients with severe asthma as a bronchodilating effect. In the brain, it increases your cerebral blood flow and increases your metabolic rate of oxygen consumption, and beware of emergence delirium. You can mitigate that risk with some benzodiazepines.